This evening, we have the entertaining Joel Farkas, who will tell you a bit about himself, and then we'll learn about the American Revolution through the arts. So without further ado, please welcome Joel Farkas. You can go ahead and share your screen, Joel. I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I collect autographs. This is an original document that I own. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, you will see it is signed by King George III. I'm going to show you another autograph a little bit later on. My name is Joel Farkas. I created Revolutionary War Lectures. This is kind of my retirement gig. Uh, when I retired from the real world, uh, I became a volunteer for the National Park Service at Washington's headquarters in Morristown, where I was a docent for around seven years. I've since retired from that as my lecturers have, have become almost, almost full time. Uh, on your screen, you see my website. On my website, you'll see where I'm lecturing, what lectures I'm giving in case you want to see other lectures of mine. And if any of you belong to other organizations where they bring in lectures, uh, please keep me in mind or pass on my contact information. Okay, enough self-promotion. This lecture is painting. Painting is in italics, the American Revolution, the founding of our country through the fine arts. So this is our Capitol building in Washington, D.C., and of course the dome, inside of which are these, among others, four large paintings. And these paintings are roughly 12 feet by 18 feet. I took this picture when I was there just to kind of give you some perspective. These are done by the artist named John Trumbull. Congress went to Trumbull and said, we want you to paint four pictures, pick what you feel are the most important moments in the founding of our country, which Trumbull does, Congress approves them. So we're gonna talk about these four paintings. This is the first one called the Declaration of Independence. What you're seeing here is our first Congress. Yes, our first Congress, which was one house. Our Congress today is two houses. Our first Congress was under our first constitution called the Articles of Confederation. Now, in this painting, you see the members of Congress, they're more or less on the left. They were not voted in by the people. They were pretty much appointed by the various colonial legislatures, but they elect their president, who's sitting in the chair, and that's John Hancock. Now, in June of 1776, Richard Henry Lee stands up uh, and with what's called the Lee Resolution, these United Colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states. Let's go back to the painting now. So there's a resolution on the floor, and this resolution is gonna be debated. And if it passes, we have just declared independence. You might call that a pretty big deal. So John Hancock realizes if this resolution passes, we better have something ready to send out to the world to explain what just happened. Remember, there's no internet, there's no instant communication like we have today. Everything in this situation would have to be printed. And so Hancock appoints a five-man committee to write a draft of a declaration. And the committee, what you see in your picture, the tall one kind of in the middle is Thomas Jefferson. To his left on your screen is John Adams. To his right is Ben Franklin. Behind him are Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston. And so what you're seeing is Jefferson presenting a draft to John Hancock. So we have the debate. 
and <laughs> miracle of miracles, the resolution passes and we declare independence. So let's have a little quiz on what date did we declare independence? Now I cannot hear you, uh, but most people say July 4th, but the real answer is July 2nd. That's the date that Lee's resolution passes. And that's the date that we technically declare independence. So the question becomes, so what's with July 4th? Well, that painting where you saw Thomas Jefferson giving a draft of a declaration to John Hancock, now every single word in that draft is debated. Some words are removed, some are changed, some are added. And finally, a couple of days later on July 4th, it's all ratified goes down the street to Dunlap Printers, who prints up around 200 of, these are called broadsides, think posters. There's no signatures yet. And since he got all these papers on July 4th, he dates this broadside July 4th. And so we come to celebrate independence on July 4th, but technically we declared it on July 2nd. I don't know if you guys play trivia or we used to be Trivial Pursuit, but uh, a lot of cool things in this lecture that uh, you can use. So the signatures actually start in August because the members of this first Congress, they didn't hang around Philadelphia. Some went home, some stayed, some went home, they came back and so on and so forth. The papers all get rewritten. The first one to sign is John Hancock. Now you may have heard that John Hancock said, I'm gonna make my signature so large that King George will not need his spectacles to read it. If you've heard that, it's not true. <laughs> That's just one of those myths. There is no proof anywhere that John Hancock said that. Because we're gonna go over a few more myths during this lecture, because I think they're actually kind of fun. But here's another little, another little quiz for you. What word in the Declaration of Independence is not in the Declaration of Independence? Are you ready? How about independence? Take, take my word for it. If not, you can read the document yourself. Second painting, the victory at Saratoga, where the British General Burgoyne surrenders his over 5,000 man army. Besides being a major victory, this it becomes the turning point of the war, though at the time, nobody realized it. Why? Well, we needed help and we knew we needed help. And the obvious choice was France. So the King of France kept on saying, I'm not going to support your revolution because I need to see something that convinces me that you have a chance of defeating the most successful, the most powerful military force in the world, i.e. the British. So Ben Franklin's living in Paris, trying to persuade the king to help us, and John Adams goes there, et cetera. Well, this victory at Saratoga persuaded the king to support us. Now, in Morristown, in the Morristown Green is this sculpture. It's called the Alliance, I actually call it independence. So what do you have here? Most people recognize on the screen on your right is George Washington. In the middle is Alexander Hamilton. And talking to Washington is the Marquis de Lafayette. All three were living at the Ford Mansion in May of 1780. And what is happening here is a, is a representation of the Marquis telling Washington my king will support the revolution. He has signed a treaty of alliance and commerce. Ships, weapons, men are all on the way. And that wins us our independence. Without France, we would, might all be talking with a heavy British accent today. So as I said earlier, the king of France was Louis XVI. Who was his wife? Most of you know the answer. Marie Antoinette. What was she famous for having said? For those of you who said, let them eat cake, that's what she's famous for having said. 
The trouble is she never said it. <laughs> this is another one of those myths. No one really knows how it got started. You'll read about a million explanations of what it really meant, but there's no proof she ever said it. The third painting is the British surrender at Yorktown. This is the last major battle of the war. Washington defeats Cornwallis. This is the, I'm gonna show you a different, uh, this is the same painting, but it's a little bit clearer. And so if you glance at this quickly, you assume the man in the middle on the horse is Washington and on the screen to his left is Cornwallis. Trouble is that's not true. The morning of the surrender, Cornwallis sends Washington a note. Dear George, uh, sorry, can't make it, don't feel well, sending General O'Hara instead. Well, Washington was a stickler on protocol and felt he could not accept a surrender from somebody of lesser rank than he was. So he sends a General Lincoln, by the way, no relation to Abraham Lincoln. So that's who you see in the middle, but look to the right and there you'll see Washington in the, on a horse in the back. And by the way, I'm going to blow this up. The man standing right in front of the closest to the horse, does any, anybody recognize him? That is Alexander Hamilton, who was definitely there at the battle, took part in it. Unfortunately, you can't see this, but the, the clarity, the, the artistry of these artists is absolutely extraordinary. You'd swear it was a photograph if, if you could see this in person. And the final one, King George says to the painter, Benjamin West, if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. What is he talking about? Washington resigning his commission. Absolutely unheard of from, from royalty back then. Washington wanted to make it very clear that he had no designs on power. And so he resigns his commission. By the way, this is an engraving of that piece. And when I do this lecture in person, invariably one or two people start to reach for their wallets or their purses because this is what's on the back of a $5,000 bill. I don't carry mine with me. I, you might, but I don't. And speaking of artistry, I don't know if any of you have been up to the Yale University Art Gallery. It's in New Haven where Yale is. Happens to be free, by the way. It's a wonderful, wonderful art gallery. And in it are these original paintings by John Trumbull, the artist we just spoke about. Uh, and by request, he's buried under the art gallery. By the way, his father was an early governor of Connecticut. So Trumbull has great affinity for New Haven. Now, I mentioned before the, ben the painter Benjamin West. So Benjamin West was a uh, painter to the crown. And when the war is over, he's given a commission by the king to paint the peace treaty right, in simple terms. So this is the painting, which is not finished. And you see the American delegation. Ben Franklin is in the dark suit. And again, looking at your screen, sitting to his left is John Adams. So the British painters show up. And they say, uh, why is there a painter here? And they're told, well, we're going to do this painting, and this is going to go down you know, in history for posterity's sake. And the painters say, not with our faces or not. So they sign the document, and they run out. Well, poor Benjamin West is kind of like flummoxed here. He says, wait a minute. How am I going to get paid? Well, John Adams, who I love dearly, and I think is very underappreciated. But nonetheless, John Adams thought, this was about the funniest thing he'd ever seen. He bought the unfinished painting. Had it shipped to his home in Massachusetts. Eventually it was bought by a member of the DuPont family. And it's now in the, I'm not sure I'm saying it, pronouncing it correctly, but the Wittenauer uh, Museum in uh, Delaware. Now, another famous painter at that time was Charles Wilson Peel. And yes, there are two L's in the middle, his middle name, Wilson. He was the first painter to paint George Washington from life. Went down to Mount Vernon, discussed with Washington how, how Washington wanted to appear. Washington said, I want to be shown in my French and Indian War uniform. These paintings of George Washington were extremely important because Washington became the image 
that people rally, could rally around and was associated with the fight for independence. You know, again, there's no internet, there's no CNN, there's no television. Uh, so the idea of independence is really a concept. But if you can see something that represents independence, that makes it all the more powerful. And that's what these images of George Washington represented. People could now see what they were fighting for. And these images had huge power. All these paintings did. You know, in our world today, we are inundated with images. It, it doesn't matter where you look. It wasn't like that 200 odd years ago. So give me an example of the power of these paintings. So this is another painting by Charles Wilson Peel. This is actually the Battle of Princeton. And so this painting is hanging in the State House in Pennsylvania, which, uh, which is today Independence Hall. And a loyalist, i.e. loyal to the crown, is so angry. He, he, wants to, he wants to kill George Washington. Of course, he can't. So what does he do is he breaks into the State House and with a knife, he slashes the painting. That's how powerful these paintings were. So Charles Wilson Peale was called in and he fixed it, et cetera. This is a family portrait of Charles Wilson Peale. Now the artist himself is in the upper left, he's looking down, but the focus of this painting is in the center. The woman is Rachel, that's his wife, and she is supporting her daughter, their daughter, Margaret. Margaret is their fourth child. You see, their, their first three children all died in infancy. And here's Margaret, happy, it's a happy family scene. This is another image of Margaret. Now this is a painting, and again, it's a little diffused, but the original is like a photograph. And I have never seen a face that is more serene and more at peace. But when I first came across this, I said, there's, there's something else going on here. And I did a little more looking, found the original painting. Notice right above her hands is a ribbon that goes across her body and the strap under her chin. I thought it was to hold down the bonnet. You see, Margaret has also died. She died from smallpox, which is a horrible way to die. This is called a, what they call a memorialized painting. It's how the artist would want to remember a person. The, the entire painting is called, uh, it's, it's, they, they call it Rachel Weeping. You can see the original at the uh, uh, Philadelphia Fine Arts Museum. It's an incredibly poignant painting, uh, uh, the most poignant I've ever seen. Remember P.T. Barnum, sh showman extraordinaire? Well, before him, was Charles Wilson Peale, who started the first natural history museum in the United States. This is a self-portrait. Peale was 80 years old when he did this. You can see on the ground, on the floor in front of him, there's a mastodon jaw and there's a turkey. You know, these are things that were kind of alien to uh, Philadelphians. If you go to historic Philadelphia, you'll see the second national bank building inside of which are were, I'm using a past tense here, were over a hundred original Charles Wilson Peale portraits. Uh, I took this photograph, this was before the pandemic. The building right now is closed for renovations. I'm assuming that these original paintings are still there, uh, but nonetheless, if you want to go, go on the website and see if it's open yet. Now, Charles Wilson Peale had some sons and it's funny because he named them all after artists, right? So you've got a Rembrandt Peel and a Raphael Peel, et cetera. This is a framing that I did. In the center here, this is cut out from a document and you can see Charles Wilson Peel's signature that he signed this. But what I'm, what I'm showing you are George Washington from life that Charles Wilson Peel did. And you start from the lower left, go up, go across to the right, and stop. You can almost see Washington aging. Well, not almost, you can see it. But the one on the bottom right, that was done from life by Rembrandt Peel. 
Rembrandt Peel also did the quintessential Thomas Jefferson and another well-known image of George Washington from life. Gilbert Stewart is probably the best known of these artists, mainly because of this. I'm gonna tell you a little story. It's his image. And the reason I say best known, let's just say the most viewed, it's his image of George Washington that's on a $1 bill. But it's because of Martha Washington that, that image exists today. So in 1796, Martha goes to the painter Gilbert Stewart and says, Mr. Stewart, I want you to do a painting of the general, a portrait of the general, just like the one you did last year. Now, by the way, the one she's referring to has been lost to history. No one knows what happened to it. And she says, I'll get the general to sit one more time for you. And when you're done, you will give me that painting. So they negotiate a price. And Gilbert Stewart says, fine. And he starts painting. And people come by. And they all want one. Now, remember, everyone's original. And suddenly Gilbert Stewart, it, it, this is the holy grail of painting back then. You've created something that other people want. So you can just keep on painting more and more of them. Of course, you charge for them. But he has a problem. He promised Martha that when he finished, he'd give her the painting. How did he get around this? So he comes up with an idea. So he does, the, he does Washington in the painting, kind of like what you see on your screen. And he says to Washington in so many words, General, uh, I am actually finished with you. There's really no need for you to sit here. I just need to fill in the background. But Washington was very happy to get out of there. And Washington says, fine, I'm out of here. Now, in my imagination, this is what happens next. Washington leaves the room. Gilbert Stewart kind of chuckles to himself, maybe, makes sure, makes sure the door is closed, takes the unfinished painting puts it in the chair where Washington was sitting, right? And then proceeds to paint over 100 more of these portraits. Now in those 100 plus, he fills in the background. On the one that he started with, he never finishes it. He never gave it to Martha. You can see it today. It's shared between the Boston Fine Arts Museum in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., which is part of the Smithsonian. Of course, the mirror image is what's on the $1 bill, uh, the most viewed image in history. The War of 1812, the British eventually attack Washington, D.C. Some buildings are destroyed. Some buildings are partially destroyed. The White House was partially destroyed. President at the time was James Madison. His wife was Dolly Madison, and this is Dolly painted by Gilbert Stewart. So the British are getting closer and closer to our nation's capital. President Madison turns to his wife and says, okay, hon, we gotta leave. The British are getting close. And she says, no, I'm not leaving. You go, take your cabinet. I am not leaving until I absolutely positively have to. Well, it reached that point where she did. So she looks around one last time and she sees on the wall this life-size painting of George Washington. <clears throat> and she realizes that if the British get their hands on this painting, they could make a major propaganda piece out of this. So she, at last minute, she has it taken down, taken out of the frame, taken to safety. And this is the portrait done by Gilbert Stewart. You can see it today in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. That's usually where it is. This, this whole painting in the frame is roughly eight feet tall. This is a daguerreotype, another form of fine arts. This is kind of a precursor to a photograph. You could even call it a photograph. This is Dolly Madison at the age of 80. Tell me this is not a formidable looking woman. I, I love Dolly Madison, besides which, how can you not love a woman that has ice cream named after her? Other images by Gilbert Stewart, this one of Martha. And speaking of Martha, this is the earliest known image of Martha. When she was eight years old, her maiden name was Dandridge. And this is the last known image done of Martha. This was done in 1801, uh, a year before she died. And 
Speaking of Gilbert Stewart and the first artist we spoke about, John Trumbull, this is John Trumbull as painted by Gilbert Stewart. Now let's talk about another form of fine arts. This is a map of North America, circa 1753. You can see the 13 colonies where it says Great Britain. You can see all the land France controls. And you can see this disputed area that both countries claim. So the colony of Virginia gets word that the French are building fortifications in that area. And they send some of their militia to tell the French to leave. So what are militia? Militia are basically citizen soldiers, although at the time there was no standing army. They're barely trained, if at all, and they were haphazardly equipped, if at all. And this group of militia is led by a 21-year-old militia major named George Washington. Washington goes to the French. They disagree. Washington returns to Virginia. The following year, Washington goes back. Now he has more men with him. There's a firefight. Men are killed. And this is the beginning of what we call the French and Indian War. Well, Washington and his men are driven back. Virginia requests and receives a standing army from England. And now the, the British regulars have to fight alongside the militia, <laughs> who are just about the opposite of the British regulars in all regards. So the British regulars ridiculed the militia. They, they, they had disdained contempt, but they ridiculed the militia with a song called Yankee Doodle. And on the count of three, although I cannot hear you, I want you all to start singing as loud as you can, Yankee Doodle. One, two, three. Keep singing. All right, that's enough. <laughs> now, of course, I, I can't hear you. When I give this lecture in person, it never fails. Pretty much everybody remembers the melody. I mean, when was the last time you sang the song? When was the last time you even thought about this song? Usually we're talking decades. And many people remember the words, if not all the words, certainly some of the words, which leads me to just exactly what do the words mean? Well, what's a Yankee? Do not say a baseball player. Yankee is a derogatory term used by the British against the colonists. And what's a doodle? Well, a doodle is just a, um, a simpleton. So you've got a double negative. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat, and called it macaroni. What does pasta have to do with anything? Well, in colonial times, if you were the height, the epitome of Italian fashion, you were called a macaroni. So now what this song is saying is look at these colonists. They are so dumb, they think that by putting a feather in their hat, it makes them the height of fashion. And that is what that song means. By the way, there are multiple verses to the song, uh, uh, but this is just one of them. And of course, Yankee Doodle and all the variations uh, becomes a patriotic song. The fine arts as influencers. For those of you who, who, who know what I'm talking about, before TikTok and before Instagram, there was the pamphlet, the painting, and the poem. The pamphlet is Common Sense, written by Thomas Paine, published in January of 1776. One of the most important pamphlets, documents ever printed, influential, the country was, in simple terms, divided in thirds. A third were for uh, independence, a third against, and a third not sure. After common sense came out, it's estimated one out of every five households, and all 13 colonies had a copy. Think of this for a second. Enormous numbers, hugely influential. The historian Gordon S. Wood called common sense the most incendiary and popular pamphlet of the entire revolutionary era. Cannot overstate how important common sense was written by Thomas 
pain. Of course, the quintessential image of the Revolutionary War, Washington crossing the Delaware, painted by Emanuel Leutze. This painting was not meant to represent an actual event. Leutze uses the event to show that it's possible to affect a change if people, regardless of their backgrounds, work together. He was referring to political upheavals that were starting or at least trying to happen in Germany in 1850, around 18, starting in 1848. But I want to take this painting. So this painting is Washington going across the Delaware from Pennsylvania back to New Jersey to attack Trenton. But I want you to turn this painting around. After the horrible battle of Long Island where Washington loses big time, but manages to escape with what's left of his army and the British chase him up Manhattan across the Hudson around Fort Lee, down all through New Jersey, finally gets to the Delaware, he crosses over, he gets a chance to breathe, but who's there to greet him? But the Kingston Trio. Yes, folks, the Kingston Trio. Remember the Kingston Trio? In 1961, they had a hit song called the MTA. The opening line of this song, these are the times that try men's souls. You know who wrote that? Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine wrote another hugely influential pamphlet called The Crisis. Uh, so that's two things that Thomas Paine wrote. Uh, I, I, Thomas Paine led a life that, is, that it, it, you'd swear it was fiction, except it really happened. I'm only giving you a small part of it. If you go to Morristown, not the green, but just a, a very short distance from the green, the other side of the courthouse is a little park called Burnham Park. Actually, from the sidewalk in the street, you can see this sculpture. This is Thomas Paine, and he is writing the American crisis. If I blow this up, I don't know if you can, no, you can't see it on your screen, but he is. But let's go back to the painting. So now we have Washington crossing the Delaware. And as I said, this painting was done for political reasons, for promotional reasons, promoting the idea that it is possible to affect a change if everybody just works together. And he uses Washington crossing the Delaware as an example of that. What is this an image of? I'm not even going to say it, but I think most of you know it. All right, I will say it. Paul Revere's Ride. Paul Revere's Ride was a poem written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I call it a poem of parallels. See, the original ride was a warning, right? I think you all know that. Paul Revere is going to warn John Hancock and Samuel Adams who were hiding in Lexington because they were wanted by the British for treason and he's gonna to go to Concord because the British have learned that in Concord, the Sons of Liberty have weapons and ammunition hidden there. And so British patrol is going to go out and go to both, both places. A warning. The poem was written as a warning. The warning is that the country was rapidly heading towards the Civil War over the issue of slavery. Let me give you an idea about this, the, this poem. I'm only going to read you a little bit of it. Listen, my children, you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive. Well, you can bet there's hardly a man now alive. The original ride was 1775, and this is 1860 when he wrote it. That's 85 years. Let me skip to the end. Born on the night wind of the past, right? 85 years earlier, in the hour of darkness and peril and need. This is what Longfellow is seeing. This is his fear. The people will waken and listen to hear. This is his hope, which of course did not happen. The midnight message, midnight, no time left message of Paul Revere. That's the poem. But I want to talk about the real ride, what really happened. It starts with this man, doctor, medical doctor, also eventually major general, Joseph. Warren. By the way, Warren, New Jersey is named after him, although he was he's not from Warren, New Jersey. 
He is the head of the Sons of Liberty, because I just said the other heads, John Hancock and Samuel Adams are hiding in Lexington. And Han Warren has a spy in British headquarters. And to this day, nobody knows who that spy is, by the way. And the spy alerts Warren that the British have found out about Hancock and Adams and the hidden uh, weapons, et cetera, in Concord. And they're sending out a patrol to go to both places. So Warren calls in his favorite writer, Paul Revere, to warn both places of what of the impending British arrival. And then he realizes, you know, there are random British patrols out at night. What if them stops? What if one of them stops Paul Revere? Who's going to warn Lexington and Concord? So he calls in a second man, a man named William Dawes. And they both go to Lexington, but they take different routes. Have any of you ever heard of William Dawes? In all probability, no, because he was not in the poem. I always felt sorry for William Dawes. So we're going to do a little shout out to William Dawes. It is all very well for the children to hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. But why should my name be quite forgot? Who rode as boldly and well got what? Why should I ask? The reason is clear. My name was Dawes and his Revere. <laughs> a little shout out to William Dawes. This is another one of the painters of that era, John Singleton Copley. And it just ironically, he did the quintessential images of the main players of Paul Revere's ride. So Dr. Joseph Warren by John Singleton Copley, the quintessential Paul Revere, John Hancock, and Samuel Adams. Another form of fine arts are, are engravings. This is an engraver named Henry Pelham. So after the Boston Massacre, Henry Pelham does an engraving, prints off copies, which eventually he's going to get around to selling maybe. He doesn't really do much. And in the meanwhile, a second engraver comes across this and says, you know, I can make some subtle changes and turn this into a major propaganda piece against the British. So this is the image that we're all familiar with. But I want to show you just one, just one of these subtle changes that the second engraver did that turned this into a powerful and big seller, I might add, a uh, uh, piece against the British. So on the original engraving, you look at the building. This is on the left on your screen. You see two rows of windows. And on the wall between the windows, there's nothing. It's just a wall, right? Now I'm going to blow up the second engraver. And look what he did. Second engraving, the engraver put a sign, Butcher's Hall. Get it? The British are butchering your friends and your neighbors. Who was the second engraver? Paul Revere. I want to talk about Benedict Arnold, but not in the traditional way of what he did and why he did what he did, et cetera. Another form of fine arts are historical markers. And of course, where we live, there are tons of them. Uh, and the issue became, do you mention Benedict Arnold in an historical marker if it was when he was a hero, as opposed to afterwards when he becomes a traitor. Because before he became a traitor, he was the best general Washington had. So his first success was in capturing Fort Ticonderoga. He and another officer, uh, another gentleman named Ethan Allen, came up with the same idea, but independent of each other. They eventually hook up. They're successful in capturing Fort Ticonderoga. 100 plus years later, a commission is formed to, to erect a marker. You mentioned Benedict Arnold in this marker. You do not. You mentioned Ethan Allen, but you do not mention Benedict Arnold. Next, Benedict Arnold goes up to Canada to try to capture Quebec City. Uh, he was not successful. 
but due to a number of things, and one of which was he was shot in the leg, uh, he comes back actually a, a hero. But here's a marker which commemorating that attempt, and they mention him by name. Next, Washington turns to Arnold and says, the British are sending down the fleet of ships from Canada. I need you to stop them. And Arnold had experience as a sea captain. He builds a small fleet of ships and comes up with a strategy around a place called Valcor Island. Although he loses the battle, he delays the British long enough that they have to go back up to Canada before winter sets in. So he succeeded in thwarting the British objective. So here's a marker where they mention Benedict Arnold by name, and here's one where they do not, which leads me to the final one. Now, we spoke earlier about the uh, uh, surrender of, of General Burgoyne at Saratoga. The hero of Saratoga, the man that made this victory happen, was Benedict Arnold. In this battle, Arnold is shot in the leg. It's ironically the same leg that he was shot in up in Canada. So 100 plus years later, commission is formed to do a monument. Do you mention Arnold by name? You mention his leg. This is called the Boot Monument. If you go to Saratoga National Historical Park, ironically, I'm going to be there in August. Uh, this is what you will see. Fine arts. You know, there's a lot of myths, a lot of stories about George Washington. Some of them we just have no idea how they got started, but some of them we do. And kind of a fun one is the one about the cherry tree. Did George Washington chop down a cherry tree? And the answer is he did not, but we know where this came from. It starts with this man. Mason Locke Weems, Mason, uh, they called him Parson Weems. And after George Washington died, he wrote a booklet about George Washington. And it was really geared towards younger readers. And each chapter talks about one of George Washington's attributes. So there's this chapter on honesty. This is the artist Grant Wood. Grant Wood ironically did a painting called The Ride of Paul Revere. Kind of a unique style, I think. But this is not what he's best known for. Anybody know what he's best known for? American Gothic. I'm going to take just a little side view here, a side trip here. Have any of you been to Grounds for Sculpture? If you go there, you will see this. This thing is something like 25 feet tall sculpture of American Gothic. I don't know who the young woman is in front, but it gives you an idea of just how tall this sculpture is. And I wanna show you one more sculpture. I don't think it's there anymore, but it's really pretty funny. And here I am holding on to Marilyn Monroe's leg. <laughs> but let's go back to Grant Wood. So Grant Wood did a painting called Parson Weems' Fable. All right, so you see Parson Weems, and you look at his finger pointing to George Washington, holding the ax, and George Washington is saying to his father, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. So what is Grant Stewart, Grant Wood trying to say? Well, let's take a closer look at George Washington because here you see Grant Wood's 66, uh, Gilbert Stewart's 66 year old head on Grant Wood's six year old body. <laughs> so what is Grant Wood trying to say? Well, in my opinion, He's trying to say George Washington is ageless, George Washington is timeless, and George Washington orders you to attend my next lecture. And you can see where I'm lecturing just by going on my website. Now, I want to talk about one more thing. The Battle of Monmouth, and of course, the other painting by Emmanuel Leutzer. But I want to talk about it maybe a little bit differently. The painting, Washington Rallying the Troops. What led Washington to, to need, to have to rally the troops? And how was he able to do this successfully? This is kind of the backstory 
that oftentimes you look at the painting and it's very, uh, it's, you know, rousing, patriotic, but there's a lot more to it that I think is, is really fascinating and important. And it begins with Valley Forge. This to me, what I'm gonna tell you next is the most valuable thing about Valley Forge. And that was the arrival of Baron Frederick Wilhelm von Steuben. Extremely underappreciated and very, very important. So von Steuben is a Prussian trained army officer there's nothing going on in Europe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut the story short, just give you the highlights. He eventually meets Ben Franklin, who gives him a letter of introduction. Von Steuben decides to come to America and hopefully the, the American army will basically hire him. He goes to Congress with the letter from Ben Franklin. Congress says, love to help you, but quite frankly, we're out of money. Von Steuben says, you know what, no problem. Let me go to Valley Forge where General Washington is you don't have to pay me anything. When the war is over, pay me whatever you think I'm worth. Well, Congress said, okay, that, that's a good deal. So von Steuben goes up, shows up at Valley Forge. You know, Washington really doesn't know he's coming. And von Steuben says something to Washington that to me changes once again the war. And he says to Washington, your army has no discipline. In other words, your army has never been trained. You have a bunch, you have 13 different militias trying to work together as an army, but without discipline, without order, without training, you have a mob and you will never defeat the British. Eventually, they will defeat you. Let me train your army. This is what I do. Discipline. So Washington liked von Steuben. Washington had pretty good people skills at the end of the day. He liked von Steuben. He said, go ahead and do it. And von Steuben did. And he, von Steuben speak, didn't speak any English. But, there were the, but he did speak some French. And there were those who interpreted. So what he did was he got maybe 100 men. And through the interpreter, he trained just 100 men. And when he trained them and when they were at the stage where he wanted them to be, they, each of those hundred trained another hundred and so on and so forth. Now, Washington is in Valley Forge, which is right outside of Philadelphia. The reason he's there for this winter encampment is because the British army occupies Philadelphia. In the spring, the British army leave Philadelphia and they are headed back to New York to regroup and re-strategize, et cetera. And Washington turns to one of his generals, General Charles Lee, and says, General Lee, I want you to take a troop of men, and I want you to go after the British. You are to engage them in combat. You are not, I repeat, not to retreat. We will come up and reinforce you. So Lee goes, and he engages the British, and then he retreats. Why? Interesting question. A lot of speculation. The one that kind of resonates with me is that Lee always felt he should have been the commander in chief. Lee was a crazy guy, by the way, but he always felt he should have been the commander in chief. He intentionally retreated he was, and, and, and lose the army, uh, uh, this battle. It was a big battle. And then he was going to go to Congress and say, see, Washington doesn't know what he's doing. Make me commander in chief except there's Washington, who immediately takes command and rallies his troop. Now, the word rally here means he turns his retreating troops. The British, his, the British are routing the American troops. They're, they're, just, they're just abandoning the, their position any way they can to get out of there. And Washington rides between the two armies and he starts giving orders. And because his army has now been trained by von Steuben, and this is the importance of von Steuben, his men turn around. They follow Washington's orders without hesitation and they re-engage the British. And what looked like it was going to be an absolute disaster 
at the end of the day, it was basically a draw from a, from a battle standpoint, but Washington now has an army and this battle proves that it's capable of standing up to and eventually defeating the British. And that was the real value of von Steuben. Now, in 1853, an American, he's a, he was an art collector. He was actually a financier, but he had an art gallery in the Berkshires. And he commissions Leutze to do this painting, Washington rallying the troops. Now, first time around, after Leutze did Washington crossing the Delaware, he goes to Congress and he says, I want to do a sister piece called Washington rallying the troops. Same, it's actually a little bit larger than, the, than Washington crossing the Delaware. This piece is roughly 13 feet by 23 feet. And Congress says no, for whatever the reasons. Well, the art collector, his name is David Levitt, he commissions Loyce to paint this huge painting, which is now hand, uh, it, it's hanging at, I think it's UC Berkeley, it's somewhere in California. And then about three years later, he commissions Loyce to do a smaller version, which he presents to his daughter, not Leutze's daughter, but uh, Levitt's daughter, and it hangs in her home. I want to show you something interesting. So the, when the original painting was done and is on display, of course, art critics come in, and many of them complained. They didn't like George Washington's face because it showed anger. Uh, and Washington was, was basically a god, and gods don't show anger. In fact, they don't show any emotion. They're kind of, they're above all of this. So there was some criticism, not about the painting, but about George Washington's face. So when Lloyd said the, the smaller one that you have um, in your collection, he changed George Washington's face. So you can see the original on your left. Notice the anger. And, and Washington should have been angry. But the one on the right, notice how now Washington's face is, is like flat affect, uh, as it would be called. Uh, I thought that was actually kind of, kind of interesting. Let's go back to the painting for just a moment. Because in this painting, so you see Washington, of course, he's got his sword up in the air, but do you realize this right over here? That's General Charles Lee. Notice how he's kind of slumped over, right? He's a little bit in shadow. Later that day, when the battle, when, uh, when he had time, Washington relieves Lee of command. And who does he replace? Lee with Baron von Steuben. Started this lecture with my autograph of King George. I'm going to show you one more autograph. This is a record album I own, autographed by Elvis Presley. Now, why am I showing you Elvis Presley? Because on behalf of myself and the real king, get it? Not this King George guy on the left, who I might add, if you look at his face, he's kind of looking quite admiringly at Elvis Presley. But on behalf of myself and the real king, thank you. Thank you very much. So that this is my, again, contact information. Uh, I am now going to get out of screen sharing and we'll see if we have any questions. So just hang in there a moment. That was so wonderful, Joel. And <laughs> yeah, that should do it. Okay, hold on. Let me share my screen just so we don't have all these. Da, da, da. Fantastic. I learned so many cool things. Um, I don't even really know where to begin. I probably should just open it up to the chat. That's I do fine. have a question for you. I wrote them down. That's okay. But you know, sure. funny talking about the the Leutze and comparing the two faces. Mm -hmm. Maybe I shouldn't say it, but I I I look at the two. I look at the one where he's supposed to be really angry, mm -hmm. and um, doesn't he, he really doesn't look so angry? He looks mildly concerned. I don't right. know. And the other one, he's just he definitely has a little bit more of a serene look. But yeah, never understood the, that whole anger issue. I, Right. Part of the problem is, actually, I, I, I alluded to it before. In our world today, 
we are so inundated with images, movie pictures, television, I mean, you name it. Back then, the, the, uh, it, it, these, even, even just a slight thing took on a lot more meaning because people just weren't inundated as they are with it, uh, as we are today. That's, and that's really the only way I, that I can explain it. Yeah, uh, that's so true. They're paying more attention. They have less distraction and they're really focused. Exactly, on exactly. The details. Wow, so cool. All right, let me see. I'm, can you see the chat? You can't see the chat, right? Uh, I cannot actually, All so right, you can okay. just read them to me. And five new messages, hold on. Okay. Ah, so here's a good one. I'm not, I don't know if you know the answer to it. You might. Um, someone is asking, I thought Washington always rode a white horse. Yes, that's interesting. The painting is wrong. Washington should have been on a white horse in the painting. And I do not know why I didn't, I didn't get that far, but I did come across, uh, there's a, there's an analysis of the paint, both paintings, uh, on the internet. And I forget where it's from, but it's really detailed. And it's somewhere in there, it came across the horse colors were wrong. But so. the horse's colors are correct. Okay. Because the, his white horse, Nelson, right. died from heat stroke that morning. So he actually had to borrow someone else's horse. He was on a brown horse that day. Oh, good one. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, he had two white horses, I think. And uh one of them didn't make it, like uh, oh. unfortunately, a lot of the men that day. That's interesting. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, what else do we have? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Oh, someone would like to know if you have a book with this information in it. She'd love to read it. Uh, I appreciate it, but I do not. Okay. Uh, who else? Anybody else have messages? I thought it said we had five, but I'm not. Oh, they left. Okay. Um, one of the things that I was curious about. In one of the paintings that you have, George Washington resigning his commission, mm -hmm. there's like two little girls in the background. Hang on a second. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I just thought that was like unusual to see. Yeah, right, right, right. What are, what are they doing there, right? They're just two like youngish looking girls. They didn't look like women to me and they're sort of standing um, in the background. Yeah, I, I see what you're talking about. They may have been someone's daughters. That would be my guess. Interesting. Yeah, because I see, I, I, cameo. See, I see women there. I see it, one, two, at least two other, two women, three. Mm -hmm. So it was more than, for whatever the reasons, there were some women there. I'm they assuming they were younger than women, though, right? Her. To me, they I'm look sorry? like. They look younger. Than, they look like oh, they do girls ab to me. Absolutely. But uh, right behind them are uh, three women that I see. Mm -hmm. uh, who are uh, maybe the mothers of these daughters. Maybe they, those are the wives of yeah, um, someone there. Okay. Um, any other questions tonight? And, you know, I had never seen that Dolly Madison daguerreotype. That's really cool. It is. I, I have her autograph too, by the way, but Do you? tonight. Yeah. Yeah. I and love Dolly Madison. She was just the coolest lady. She really was. Yeah, hot tamale. So that one, what, what did it say? Like 1848, right? So that was just about 10 years after, uh, less less than 10 years after they just started with daguerreotype. So if somebody knew, better get a, you know, better capture this image of this important woman. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, uh, someone would like to know if you were a history professor. <laughs> no, I owned a business. What business? But, uh, huh? What business did you own? I owned a wholesale janitorial supply company called Liberty Paper in Bayonne, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, but now when I sold my business and retired, I became a volunteer for the National Park Service at Washington's headquarters. I did that for seven or eight years. I was a docent in the Ford Mansion. And that kind of got me started in all this. And I wanted to share uh, all this information. And it kind of blossomed. I've written 20, 21 to 22 lectures. I only show some of them on my website because I have found too many lectures gets, gets too confusing. Mm -hmm. So I think there's nine. I just finished a lecture, my second lecture focusing on women during the American Revolution. My first one is entitled Remember the Ladies. And my second one is celebrating women before 
during and after the American Revolution, where I came across some really not only interesting people, but Native American society, uh, which I found unbelievably, I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't even planning on it's happening. It just kind of morphed into, because that, that happens when I, when, when I get started on a lecture and it's, there'll be tangents here and a tangent oh, there. Yeah. And next thing I know, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm off somewhere and I'm learning about stuff and I'm, whoa, this is, and I'll change maybe the direction or partially change it. So uh, I got some new thing. I have uh, I haven't even announced the lecture yet, although it is listed on, on my website. I'll be announcing it in, in about two months officially. So, uh, but anyway, that, that's how I got started. So I was not a history teacher. I'm so glad you did <laughs> because you really did um, an amazing job and definitely- well, Thank you. Yeah, really great. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Joel? Um, have you done anything with the effects of the war on indigenous people? No, mm -hmm. I have not. Uh, and I know there's a whole, you cannot read um, pretty much anything, especially when you go back to the early years. When you talk about Puritan New England and the Wampanoags, which were the, the tribe that at the quote unquote first Thanksgiving, if you want to use that painting. And I actually, I have a lecture all about that, but I don't really get into at this point in time, um, the treatment of the Native Americans. Okay. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's just so many endless uh, topics, uh, right? I'm sure you'll get <laughs> Correct. I'm, 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 I have a lecture on the books uh, where I talk about um, I, I, have a, I have a working title, Becoming America. Mm -hmm. And America not only refers to the United States of America, but the continent of America. And the early civilizations, the Mayan civilization, the Inca, you know, there was a civilization called, called the Mound Builders or the Mississippians mm -hmm. in North America. And they were a huge civilization. And then they, like disappeared, but the mounds are still there. And so I'm, I'm kind of work on that. And then I bring it forward to uh, the founding of our country. And a lot of that, and it has to do with Henry VIII. It has to do with Christopher Columbus. Uh, they all play a part. In some cases, they weren't exactly the, the nicest people in the world. The Spanish in particular were brutal people uh, trying to force Catholicism on anyone living in North America. The French weren't a whole lot better, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, it's, it's a violent, brutal history uh, that eventually leads to uh, our country. So. Uh, and just one more. Okay. Sure. Uh, someone's asking, okay, she's saying her British ancestor, John Love, was impressed to fight in the American Revolution and supposedly he switched to fight for the colonies. Can you recommend a site to try to find him on a roster? You would need Marion to go, if you have some idea of where he fought, you would need to go to, you know, the, the clerk's office or, you know, that local historical association. For example, we have um, for Monmouth County, it's an amazing database um, called Database of the American Revolution. And it was uh, this man, Michael Adelberg's project, just an incredible historian. And he went and he collected all of the records for every citizen that lived in Monmouth County. It was about 7,200. Um, and so it it will list whether or not they were in the military. So you need to find um, an archive that has something like that. It's unlikely that it's gonna be online, but sometimes you just have to do the digging. Okay. All right, Joel, I don't wanna keep you too late. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope that we'll have you back again. I'm sure we will. My pleasure and thank you and thank everybody for, for attending. And I, I also hope to see you all again. Good night. Have a good night. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.